button, we'll all go quiet for a couple of seconds. It's already recording now, so. Sorry? Uh, the, the record has started. Okay, great. Thank you so much, thanks. And Dan has gone to get another book to add to the thousands behind him. <laughs> <laughs> Academics can never have enough books. I mean, look at my wall, look at his, spot the academic. Okay, here we go, everyone quiet. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. Just a reminder that this event is being recorded and that once we've heard from our panel, we intend to have time for questions and answers. So do please go ahead and start putting your questions in the Q&A tab, which will be at the bottom of your screen. So as you will know, this is a joint LIDC event with Afford UK, and it was born out of a big event that LIDC organized with our member colleges back in June, um, where we discussed various things that need to be done around decolonizing global development, because as you'll be aware, the term development itself is quite a loaded trope. We had a riveting presentation then on decolonizing heritage, with Onyeka Chiwambu from, um, he's director of Afford UK. And as always is the way with these things, we ran out of time to have the full discussion that we wanted to have. So I was very grateful when Onyeka Chi then proposed that we have a joint event on this topic. Thank you very much for joining us. Before I hand you over to Professor Ampofo, a few words. Um, starting with a few personal words. To me, the personal is always political. I am a Creole from Sierra Leone. Um, and unfortunately, we always seem to be in the news these days for quite sad reasons. Um, there was that awful event last week. And I know that the Sierra Leone Dental and Medical Association is doing a GoFundMe fundraiser. So if you're able to support that, please do. Um, I grew up in Sierra Leone, went to a church missionary society school, the Annie Walsh Memorial School, quite a prestigious school in Freetown. And there we were taught that we had to be grateful to the British for freeing us from slavery, which always seemed a bit odd <laughs> to me, because we then learned that there were great Britons like Francis Drake and Jack Hawkins who came to Africa, captured Africans, sold them as slaves, so why do we then need to be grateful that they quote unquote freed us, which actually isn't how it really panned out. So this has been an area that's always been a sort of personal resonance to me. Um, I also spent a lot of my childhood in the north of Sierra Leone, a province called Kono, which is a big diamond mining enclave. And there was almost an apartheid like system there where my family were treated as sort of honorary whites because my stepdad was educated and made it into the senior services. And we know that the consequences of the racial division um, brought about by slavery and colonialism hasn't ended well for Sierra Leone and indeed for people of African descent all over the world. We are informed by the stories that we are told and most of us have not been the tellers of our own stories. So I'm very glad that there are people like we have on the panel here today who are able to guide us as we visit, revisit and redress some of those stories. Um, so for those of you who are new to LIDC, a few words about who we are, what we do. We were founded in 2007 by Bloomsbury Colleges to bring academics, researchers, staff, students, activists together to work on issues in global development. We also have a number of NGO members as well as higher education institutions. We hold events, a whole range of events. We provide a platform for the work of our colleagues and collaborators. 
If you look on our website, you'll see that we have featured member pieces, blogs, we do training and grant writing workshops. We have an evaluation course, which is running this week. We do a lot of events that are for our members only. So we had a careers events for students last week. We put partners together and we provide practical help to get projects off the ground. So you may have heard of Global Panel or Action Against Stunting Hub, which is a quite large um, research hub looking at the consequences of poor nutrition in a child's first thousand days. We do encourage you to live tweet in our events. I've already sent you the useful Twitter handles, including one for the British Museum. Please use the hashtag LIDC seminars. So very grateful that we have Professor Akoswa Adomako Ampofo, Professor of African and Gender Studies at the Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana, to moderate the event today. Professor Ampofo is President of the African Studies Association of Africa, an honorary professor at the Center for African Studies at the University of Birmingham, and a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Science. She was the foundation director of the University Center for, Ge Center for Gender Studies and Advocacy um, from 2005 to 2009. And for five years from 2010, she was director of the Institute of African Studies. And Omako consider her, considers herself an activist scholar, the best kind. Her areas of interest include African knowledge systems, higher education, race and identity politics, gender relations, masculinities and popular culture. Among her current projects with Kate Skinner, University of Birmingham, is an archive of activism, gender and public history in post-colonial Ghana, which seeks to constitute a publicly accessible archive of and documentary on gender activism and political women in post-colonial Ghana. So with no further ado, it gives me great pride and honor to introduce you to Professor Adomako Ampofo. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Shireen, for that generous introduction. And um, from me as well, good afternoon to everyone. I'd like us, um, with, all, with you all's permission, to observe a moment's silence for the families um, and loved ones of, um, you know, what's, got, what's just happened in Sierra Leone. If some of you are not aware, there was a, a tanker blast and, um, you know, a lot of lives were lost. We also probably want to remember, not probably should be remembering, um, Ethiopia, what's going on in Addis. We can think of the the deaths at the rap concert in Houston, Texas, and on and on, you know, uh, brothers and sisters, there's struggles going on, and uh, many of us are hurting and healing and have been for the last two years. So just a moment, silence, to do some remembering. Um, I would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are in for a treat this afternoon. And um, even though it, this is a difficult uh, subject, it's a painful subject, the, the growing energy around the movement and what I have read in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, that's going on. I have learned so much more. And I feel a wee, a wee bit more hopeful than I might have been um, without the new information that I have. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we can have this conversation. And um, please all indulge me to share a little story from my own context, because I'm hoping that what we talk about today will engender some work for uh, lost artifacts, stolen artifacts um, from Ghana as well. The, the, the activism from our space has been um, a little less um, stellar. So I'm, I'm sure that you all are familiar with, with the Asante. They are probably the most um, well-known indigenous kingdom in what we now know as Ghana. 
and for several reasons, prominent among them being their resistance, their strong and extensive resistance to British rule. And um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the uh, golden stool, the Asante golden stool. So uh, the, the Asante empire was established through conquest and negotiations under Asante Hine Osei Tutu, uh, the first, who built an empire from these several quote unquote, Akan nations, if you will. And oral history asserts that the great priest of Asante Okonfanoche brought down a golden school, the Sikedria Kofi. Mm. Kofi is a Friday born, so the stool was born on a Friday. And the Osei Tutu, um, oral history tells us, brought down this stool from the heavens as testimony of Osei Tutu's authority, but also to stamp the unity of the Asante state among you know, this collective. And this tool not only represents the authority of the Asante Hine himself, but it also enshrines the very soul of the Asante nation. It's made of solid gold, and it never touches the ground. It's carried in processionals and has its own throne. I have only seen it once during the funeral rites of um, the previous Asante Hine, Asante Hine Opokuare II in 1999, when it was carried through the streets of Kumasi, the Asante capital. Now, Asante Hine Prempe I was exiled by the British to the Seychelles in 1986, in 1896, I'm sorry. And in 1900, Sir Frederick Hodgson, the then governor of the Gold Coast, um, which is what we were called by the British before independence, demanded to be allowed to sit on the golden stool. Hodgson advanced towards Kumasi with a small force of British soldiers and local levies um, arriving somewhere in March of 1900. And um, as a representative of a powerful nation, as he constructed it, he was accorded traditional honors upon entering the city, and they even sang, the children even sang God Save the Queen. So there was this mutual recognition that you're, you come from a nation state, and we are a nation state, and we'll give you the courtesies of one uh, state to another. After ascending the platform that had been set up for him, he made a speech to the assembled Asante leaders. The closest surviving account of that speech supposedly comes from an Asante translator, and I'm quoting um, you know, how this has been recorded for us today. So Hodgson is purported to have said, your king, Prempe I, is in exile and will not return to Ashanti, Sikh. Um, we say Asante, not Ashanti, but this is how you will see it written in many books. His power and authority will be taken over by the representative of the, of the Queen of Britain. The terms of the 1874 Peace Treaty of Fomena, which required you to pay for the cost of the 1874 war, have not been forgotten. This was a war between uh, Britain and Asante. You have to pay with interest the sum of £160,000 a year. Then there's the matter of the golden school, stool of Ashanti. The queen is entitled to sit on the stool. She must receive it. Where is the golden stool? I am the representative of the paramount power. Why have you relegated me to this ordinary chair? Why did you not take the opportunity of my coming to Kumasi to bring the golden stool for me to sit upon? And he ordered that the search for it be made, which turned up nothing. The speech was received in silence by the assembly. And under the passionate call of the then queen mother, Yasantua, the trembling hearts of the nation were revived, and the war of the Golden Stool, or the Yasantua War, was uh, ensued. She, Yasantua, called out into Alia, if you, the men of Asante, will not go forward, then we will go. We, the women, we will go. I shall call upon my fellow women. We will fight. We will fight till the last of us falls in the battlefields. She then collected men to form a force with which to attack the British and retrieve the exiled king. And though I would love to wax um, about our brilliant ancestress, her story is not for today. On the 19th of March, 1901, the British statesman David Lloyd George stated in a parliamentary session that, quote, Frederick Hodgson's quest of the golden school stool was something like the quest of the Holy Grail. Others have um, likened it to asking, asking for the, the, the um, Ark of the Covenant. Israel, in, in ancient um, Israel. Fortunately, the British never got the golden stool, though an Akan stool believed to be for a queen mother is found um, in the collection of the Children's Museum in Indianapolis. 
Although the golden stool is safe, the British invasion of Asante in 1874 resulted in the plunder of numerous Asante gold objects and other precious artifacts from the Asante capital, Kumasi, which remain in the Wallace collection. European and North American museums, including several on university campuses and several private collections, continue to benefit from the display of objects looted during the age of empire and colonization. Those in private collections are constantly being exchanged for huge sums of money. Many, like the Benin bronzes that we'll hear more about today, looted by British colonial forces in 1897, continue to be deployed as trophies to colonialism. Few artifacts embody this history of, and I'm quoting here, rapacious and extractive colonialism better than the Benin bronzes. According to Professor Dan Hicks, one of our speakers today, and author of Brutish Museums, some 161 museums and galleries in Europe and North America currently possess and display Benin bronzes. These refer to a collection of thousands of metal plaques and sculptures depicting the history of the royal court of the Obas of Benin City, Nigeria. I read and I quote, since its first public, of the British, of, the, of uh, Professor Hicks's book, since its first publication, that is British, British Museums, museums across the Western world have begun to return their bronzes to Nigeria, heralding a new era in the way we understand the collections of empire we once took for granted, unquote. Onyekachi Wambu, and all of our speakers today, carried out what he termed the disobedient tour. And today's event is a follow-up of a long, of a day-long event the LIDC held in June to examine the ways in which global development, quote unquote, that problematic term that Shireen uh, referred to, that sphere reproduces an oppressive system based on socially constructed hierarchies. Of great interest was the session on decolon decolonizing global heritage that uh, Onyekachi uh, uh, led. And he continues to lead a campaign calling for the return of the icons. His session raised questions that warrant further discussion, which is why we are here today. For example, why is it acceptable for stolen items to be retained and displayed by quote unquote world class Western institutions? Why are this? And of course, the, the excuse we often hear is that institutions and museums on the African context uh, continent do not have the capacity to, to host these. Why are the stories of mass murder and plunder which surrounded the theft of these icons silenced in the narrative? We, 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 we hear these stories as if they are benign exchanges that took place. Why are restitution and reparations being withheld? And what impact has the theft of heritage in both material and cultural terms had on those from whom they were plundered? As some universities begin to announce that they will return Benin bronzes, isn't it time for other Western institutions still in possession of stolen items and those fraudulently obtained to do so? So I will now introduce um, our three speakers. Um, they will each have about 12 minutes to speak and then we will open the floor um, to you all for a time of inter active uh, conversations, questions and answers, comments, um, and so on. So Onyekachi Wambu is a former newspaper editor and television producer. Since 1990, he has led work on African cultural heritage, focusing on the impact of slavery and colonialism. He advised the late Bernie Grant, UK MP, chair of the African reparations uh, arm on African and cultural issues, and in 1995, founded African Remembrance Day. Wambu has made presentation and recommendations on African culture and heritage issues to the United Nations, the African Union, and other civil society and uh, academic spaces. And he's currently the executive director at AFORD, a charity working to enhance the contributions Africans in the diaspora make to the continent's development. Obviously, my introduction of uh, all three speakers is just a tiny slice of who they are. I'll encourage you to do the usual. Go into your search engine and read more about them. Professor Dan Hicks is a professor of contemporary archaeology at the University of Oxford. He's curator at the Pitt Rivers Museum and a fellow of St. Cross College, Oxford. Professor Hicks works on the material and visual culture of the human past and the history of archaeology, anthropology, art, and architecture. I've already mentioned his um, book, Brutish Museums, which has um, received a lot of positive critical um, review. 
and his wide experience of curatorial work includes the co-curated exhibition and book, Land, the Calais, Jungle and Beyond, published in 2019. And our last but not obviously the least speaker is Professor Paul Basu, who is also an anthropologist, curator, and filmmaker. Professor Basu recently joined University College London from the School of Oriental and African Studies, where he was Professor of Anthropology. His work has focused on the relationships between material culture, migration, and memory. For many years, he has conducted multi-sited fieldwork across diverse archives, museums, diasporas, and localities, especially work related to British colonial entanglements in West Africa. So ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, over to uh, three speakers, one after the other. I will not interrupt um, in between, except if they tend to wander over their time. So when, when you're done, we, you will just hand over to the next speaker, please. So over to you, Onyekachi. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Professor, for such a <clears throat> fulsome introduction. And I think um, the story um, and the history you gave about uh, the Ashanti region is in, in many ways uh, very similar to what happened in Benin. I mean, these um, uh, extractive conquests were of a kind. They were uh, to do with how empire uh, extends itself um, and how the imperial center um, you know, captured huge parts of the globe. And we're now really beginning to understand um, the degree to which uh, violence uh, was involved to hear the voices of the victims um, as part of that process. Because as, as you mentioned, uh, Professor, that uh, part of it has, uh, has generally not been shared in terms of the narratives. Uh, afford, um, Personally, I've long campaigned, as you said in my biog, on many of these issues. I thought has been latterly involved in this um, as an organization that uh, works to enhance the contributions that the diaspora make to Africa's development. We see developments um, in, in a very holistic way, and we see the diaspora making a number of interventions when they deploy their resources on behalf of Africa. So they make that in terms of in the financial realm through remittances, in the um, knowledge realm, intellectual realm, through the sharing of knowledge and information and skills, um, through the political realm, through uh, lobbying for new ideas um, for um, what Africa needs, and, and then through the cultural realm. and. Um, through interventions such as the return of the icons and also the diaspora's kind of cultural um, exchanging cultural capital with people in Africa. The diaspora is a big market for um, African uh, culture, whether it's music, whether it's foodstuffs, um, books, ideas. So we have focused on this cultural space now. The, in the past, we tended to focus on remittances, on skill sharing, but um, increasingly we recognize that uh, culture is going to be very, is important and, and will grow in importance. So the return of the icons is really tapping into long-standing diaspora interventions in the cultural space in terms of returning archives. Um, we go back to 1992 when, um, 93, when Bernie Grant was running the African reparations movement. And uh, I personally participated in a demonstration outside the British Museum uh, about returning the Benin bronzes. And in those days, everybody thought we were um, really, um, I, I, you know, I think we were laughed at by a lot of people who were getting to the museum. And then fast forward, now we're at a tipping point. We saw last week um, dramatic returns from, uh, you know, Jesus College in Cambridge, also Aberdeen University. We've had commitments from Germany to return um, all the artifacts, including the Benin bronzes that, that they hold. Um, we've had commitments from the Dutch, uh, the Smithsonian this week also indicated that they were um, um, willing to begin the process of return. So there's been a tipping point and um, 
and a great deal of movement. And some of that has been as a result of the uh, um, Savoy report um, in, from 2019, um, that, or 2018, 2019, that put some of these issues on the agenda, which was commissioned by uh, the French president, Emmanuel Macron. Um, but much more importantly, on a kind of grassroots level, we've seen um, the Black Lives Matter really galvanize um, some thinking around all of this. Um, in terms of the questions that we are trying to raise here about why there's been a lot of resistance, I don't think it's fair to say that that resistance um, has been uniform across the globe. As I said, the Germans have been um, made some really radical and um, very progressive and important uh, uh, no noises in this direction. Um, we're talking now about a process about how that can happen. Um, and as I said, the institutions in the UK that want to begin that process of return, and then there are others, and including one would say the government and institutions where the national institutions like the British Museum, the VNA, and others where um, government legislation would be involved in, in them beginning the process of restitution. Uh, and, and so you see a reluctance at that level, particularly from the government, about whether they will make those changes and what the noises that they're making are around, you know, if there's an official policy, it seems to be around this idea of retain and uh, explain. Um, the first thing I would say about that um, is that I think just what we're see, seeing then is a sort of continuum of different responses. And I, I've started to think about it and categorize it as, um, in a way, talking about the stages, the very popular stages of grief that we, we see, the five stages of grief. And with different peoples and different institutions at the different stages of that grief, grief continuum. So the first stage is really, um, um, denial and we've seen many people denying or are not recognizing what has happened and so there's a whole kind of discourse around that and then we've seen a, a, a stage of anger so you move from denial to anger um, and, and some of what we have seen in response to the Black Lives Matter discourse have, has been really around anger and um, the attempts to, that uh, people who are asking for the voices of the victims to be heard, for their perspectives to be uh, priced into the understanding of the past, uh, being accused of all kinds of um, ulterior motives, uh, wanting to do down Britain, etc. Um, and then we go from anger to negotiation, and we've seen very institutions actually move along that and begin that process. As I say, it seems to me the Smithsonian and others are at that stage of negotiation. And then from there, we, we move to depression um, and, uh, and then finally acceptance. And we've had uh, Pitts Rivers, um, as I said, Aberdeen uh, in the UK, Jesus College in, in, Cam uh, in Cambridge that have moved to that stage of acceptance. The rest um, uh, are further back um, along that uh, 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 continuum in terms of the stages of grief. Um, so what I find interesting about the ones who are in the uh, denial and um, uh, anger stage is that there's, even if you accept their thesis that's about retaining and explaining, um, we don't know what it is we're explaining in many cases. We don't, because a lot of this stuff is in basements, it hasn't been catalogued, and there have been no resources committed to getting a very full understanding of, of what's there. Obviously, what's on display is not, um, is, you know, a, a very small uh, package of, of what is actually exists in, in, in various basements and boxes ev everywhere. So there's a big thing that if we're going to uh, retain and explain, let's actually begin the question of finding out what it is that we're going to be explaining, what is there. And then secondly, if we're going to 
retain and explain? Who who does the explaining? Um, uh, and for me, I'm not endorsing the retain and explain policy. For me, this is you know that's the first second stage. This stuff, um, we're very clear that this stuff needs to go back. But at least we can begin uh, providing um, some knowledge around what's there uh, in a in a before and in anticipation of um, this material going back. Um, so. I think those questions are really profound. And if the government uh, and others who even have that initial position of um, not wanting this stuff to go back, they, they at least owe us a duty to invest some resources. Uh, museums are, uh, are really stretched and for them, um, the lots of other areas, they don't have the resources sometimes to do this cataloging and research work. So we would really urge that um, the you know, that these resources be made available. Um, and then the second part of that is, as we tell that the story, once we know what's there, then we're very clear that those communities from which, which these collections uh, uh, sort of came from, um, should be involved in that process of reassessing, of retelling, or, of trying to come in, come up with new narratives and, and what I would now call equal narratives of what happened in the past, because what we have heard so far is the narratives of the victor. And we need to also hear the narratives of those who were conquered and those who were, were victims and, and, and what they feel about their artifacts. I think you spoke very move, movingly, Professor, at the beginning about what still represented for the Ashanti. So again, what what, what did the bronzes represent for the people of Benin, for other Nigerians, for other Africans? And, you know, this is a, a kind of a complex series of in, engagements that we can do. And, and I'm really happy that Paul is here because I think he, his entanglements project has shown um, the way that that might, uh, one way of doing that in a really kind of a respectful way with the Igbo communities from, uh, from from the area that he was examining in eastern Nigeria, from the um, um, archives and artifacts that uh, I think it was um, um, I can't know, um, um basically um, collected. So how we involve others in that uh, discourse, I think, is really important. The other thing is that how we display this material in new ways, I think, is also going to be critical ahead of them being returned. And um, um, earlier on today, I was on another conference and, and made the point, and I will repeat it, that you know, for you know, over twenty years, I have refused to go into the mummy uh, section uh, at the British Museum because uh, it has a profound. Um, problem with the display of human remains um, so that you know, people will turn up on a Sunday afternoon with their kids and watch dead people. And I take the, uh, the golden rule perspective on this, which is uh, um, that if you don't, uh, you treat others the way you wish to be treated. And, and many of us would not want our relatives put on display in that kind of way. And I wonder why in, um, in the 20th century, sorry, the 21st century, uh, we're still doing this at, the, at uh, leading institutions like uh, the British Museum who, um, you know, we, you know, in the post-war period since 45, we made, you know, lots of commitments and we're taking huge universal ethical positions on, uh, on a whole number of issues. And it does, strike me as really strange that as curators, as, uh, as people who are custodians of this rich heritage and who, you know, and I use that word custodian and trusteeship um, uh, really seriously and who are holding this in custodian, uh, these uh, artifacts and even remains in custodianship and trusteeship before they return, um, why we're still treating them in this way. Um, there, there are a lot of um, issues to deal with, but I'm going to stop there. But to say that um, that I, I don't think that this momentum for return is going to stop for lots of historical reasons. I think we're in a 
huge um, historical moment. Um, most of this stuff was brought together as the Atlantic civilization and uh, in, um, benefited Europe and, um, and Europe, the small European countries were able to uh, engage in imperial ventures to create what we see as this Atlantic civilization. And that is now, you know, under relative terms uh, um, in decline. So what we're looking back at after South Africa in 94 is the victims of that uh, Atlantic extension and, and hearing the voices of those victims. But I think there's a huge opportunity to reevaluate all of that. The number of resets that we are about to, or we are undergoing, there's a huge climate reset. We know that's uh, going on in Glasgow at the moment. Uh, on a global level, there's been the reset around health, uh, care, and re rethinking that over the last two years about the pandemic. Um, there's been the Black Lives Matter research about the structural, legacies of um, imperialism, slavery, and, um, and, and colonialism. Um, and then there's obviously much more kind of domestically here, the Brexit reset. So a whole number of resets are, are going on. And I think there's an opportunity to put this um, restitution um, issue inside of those big global resets. And so as, as we move forward to try and create a more equitable and more um, um, kind of uh, humane, uh, human-centered um, civilization for our planet. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you and hand over to Dan. Okay, wonderful. Thanks so much, Onikachi. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen while we talk. Uh, which is hopefully going to work. And if someone could just confirm they can see that, that would be great. Yes, it's fine. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. So in the in the 12 minutes available to me, I just want to look a little bit at the language that was used in the framing of this event. And just to try and unpick that, work out what we're talking about and whether it's even yeah possible to decolonize history uh and how that might relate to reclaiming heritage um so i guess when we're talking about the decolonization movement we need to start with the theory and you know sort of thereby hopefully find ourselves in something that we can translate into practice so uh, in terms of the literature in the academic field, we could reach back uh, 10 years or so to the key observation by Tuck and Yang, writing from a North American perspective where decolonization holds that sense of land, you know, the, de the, the idea that you're speaking about stolen land rather than, as we are today, stolen art. You know, and that observation that uh, decolonization is not a metaphor. So we could reach back a little further into the 80s to Audre Lorde's observation that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, that the disciplinary structures, the institutional structures that we inherit, you know, are not you know, neutral. They are a part of as we're learning in the case of our museums, in the case of anthropology and archaeology as a discipline, they were part of an attempt not just to make knowledge, you know, in the process of empire, but to make the world fuse of empire last. And for that reason, it's important to reach back even further in terms of the language of the decolonial, to the decolonizing movements and events of the 50s and 60s, you know, and to Fanon. And so Franz Fanon's sort of observation first off that the decolonization process has to involve the decolonization of the mind. But also crucially in his essay, which certainly in my work has 
become increasingly important to me, his essay on racism and culture, where he makes the absolutely central sort of distinction in between what he calls in the mid 19th century, the emergence of uh, vulgar racism, racism applied to ideas of nature, the racist lie that anthropology was so central in that there are different kinds of human. That, were, that set of sort of racisms that used or sought to use natural history was very soon accompanied, he argues, by another kind of racism. And that other kind of racism is a racism that's far harder for us to see in the present, we're only just seeing how it comes into view, and that is cultural racism. And that's not simply the old lies that anthropology told about notions of the primitive, notions of the, of the civilized, notions of civilization. It was also about the use of our museums to tell a story of cultural supremacy. So it turns out that decolonization in part is about recognizing how art and culture have been put to work to create the myth of a cultural whiteness that has a that is in a that is in a position of supremacy. So, and so earlier on, uh, the, yeah, my book was mentioned, and I just wanted to, wanted to say that in that work I've done on the case of the Benin uh, bronzes, which is of course the most iconic example of the way in which art and culture and the display regimes of our museums and the thought processes of our disciplines were put to work for the purposes of making a victory, a military victory, seem like a cultural victory, seem like not only the re reclaiming or the, uh, the claim to sovereignty, the, the attempt to destroy traditional religion, but also the ongoing cultural you know, dispossession of the continent of Africa. So it's the most iconic example, but, but absolutely not the only one. We are not going to decolonize history, decolonize our museums or decolonize our universities simply by returning the Benin bronzes because they're only one set of of objects of of uh, uh, sort of uh, royal uh, sacred items that were taken in such sort of conditions. And importantly, the Star Savoir report that was mentioned earlier that came out three years ago, the French report into restitution introduced the notion of consent into this conversation. So the question of the taking of culture without consent has to take us into other uh, sort of context outside of only the military expeditions, you know, into other conditions where, where items were taken. And the contemporary uh, consent of you know, the rightful owners of the, of the descendant communities in the present to have a central role in actually seeking to determine what happens to those objects next. But I put this image up actually really not to talk about my book, but, but to talk about the reading for decolonization that we need to do that pushes back further than Fanon, you know, to Césaire and to, and to Du Bois, but also the crucial way in which African scholarship is at the center of these arguments at the moment. And so, and so, and, and so is Sheila Mbembe, for example, who is quoted there at the bottom has been incredibly important for, for me personally to learn from. And of course, more generally in the museum sector, we're learning that the notion of what a museum is, is being reinvented and reinvented by our African colleagues. The most exciting thinking about heritage, about culture, about museums is really coming at this moment from the continent of Africa and from indigenous communities in, in North America and elsewhere in the world as well. But the risk for us in the UK is that decolonization turns into something very, very superficial. So here I think the observation by Samaya Kasim, who wrote a reflection on her involvement in the very important exhibition at the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery 
in 2017 that was known as the past is now the past is now show was about the presence of empire in the city of birmingham the ongoing presence of it and she was one of four community curators who were involved in order to seek to diversify that narrative in order to tell unwritten histories and so on and in in this really really important intervention in reflecting on that process she talks about the risks of, of uh, co-opting. She talks about that sense that if the museum in part was set up in order to present a certain worldview of cultural supremacy, are we really gonna trust it that it simply needs to tell the other story, simply to, to, to add in further histories without actually uh, sort of making a change, without giving anything up? So as she put it in that important piece that you can find online, I do not want to see decolonization become part of the British national narrative or as a pretty curio with no substance or worse, for decoloniality to be claimed as yet another great uh, accomplishment from the British. So the railways and the two world wars and one World Cup are now fantastic. You know, decolonization as a celebratory sort of narrative. That's a real risk. So in the context of the conversations we're having in the streets about the erection of racist monuments, you know, which is a recognition that comes from the African led movement of, of, of fallism. The fallism movement emerged in Algeria in the 1960s. You know, it was seen, of course, with the Rose Must Fall campaign in uh, uh, Cape Town in 2015. And that moment, Onikachi a moment ago mentioned the key watershed of apartheid. Well, of course, you know, in 2015, the reason that roads fell at Cape Town was that there were students who were 18 or 19 years old that were born after the end of apartheid, but continued to experience institutional racism and everyday racism, racism at the heart of the academy. And in the center of that uh, campus was an image of uh, Cecil Rhodes. So art and culture very literally being put to work to naturalize, to normalize, and crucially to make last that vision of you know, white supremacy, of anti-black violence, and, and of enduring empire. So what's happening now, you know, from African-led thinking is that the, 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 uh, the dots are being uh, joined up in between the use of culture to tell that propaganda in the streets outside to what happens inside our museums. So those of us who work in institutions like this at the Pitt Rivers Museum have centrally, not just to talk or have dialogues, but be ready to recognize the role of these institutions as a central part of what, you know, in the book I call white infrastructure and to physically be ready physically to dismantle that infrastructure. What that means in part is simply shining a light as we heard from Onikachi upon what's in the stores. And I want to finish, and I've added this in after hearing the wonderful comments with which we opened. Um, I just want to add in if I can hopefully, ah, I don't know if that's working, sorry. Well, let me try and, are you able to see that? I hope you can see that image yes. it seems not yeah, to, not that. to be working on the full screen but you can see that so here is an item that is from the stores of the pit rivers which is recorded as the war stall that was uh, taken at the sacking of of the of the asante palace at at kamazi in 1874 and that came to the Pitt Rivers in, 80, in, in 1978 from a descendant of uh, Woolsey that led that attack. These items are not only in the British Museum, they're not only, this is not only about things that are on display, it's about the digging in the archives, the sharing of this information as I'm doing now, and then allowing the sharing of that, that information to drive further campaigns so items can be returned when that is what is desired. And so we can reimagine our museums, our world culture museums, 
actually these institutions that we've never needed more than we do at this moment, we can reimagine them in part as sites of conscience and as spaces for the physical dismantling of that infrastructure of white cultural supremacy. So thanks very much. I'm just going to put in the chat a, a link for those of you in London, for anyone that wants to come and hear a conversation with Errol Francis that's happening in Hackney this Thursday. So that's in the chat for anyone that wanted to come. So thanks very much. Huh? And I'll hand over now to, uh, to Paul Bazu. Hi there. Well, thank you, uh, everyone who's spoken so far. Really, uh, really very interesting conversations. Um, conscious that I have 12 minutes um, only, and I wanted to probably say quite a lot. I actually pre-recorded my, uh, my 12 minutes. So what I'm going to do is just share uh, a video um, where, um, where I won't have to uh, run over time, hopefully. So um, let me just uh, find the right screen to as always it never goes right when you need it to perhaps you could tell me if this is um visible now this just two weeks ago, the first institutional returns of artworks yes, looted during there. the British sacking of Benin City in 1897 took place in Cambridge and Aberdeen. At last, it appears that progress is being made. Many European museums have now pledged to return looted Benin treasures. Just prior to the return of the Okokor at uh, Jesus College, the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge hosted a reception for the Benin Dialogue Group, a group that includes key Nigerian stakeholders, including representatives of the OBA, the National Commission for Museums and Monuments, the Edo State Government, as well as representatives of European museums holding Benin collections. Before the OBA's brother and senior representative, the museum's director, Nick Thomas, reiterated the intention, indeed the expectation, that it would be returning its collection of artworks looted from Benin in 1897. While at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, the Benin Dialogue Group delegates also visited an exhibition, and it is this exhibition that I'd like to talk about briefly today. The exhibition, Re-Entanglements, Colonial Collections in Decolonial Times, is the culmination of a collaborative project that I've been leading over the last four years, also called Re-Entanglements. I've only time to discuss this very briefly now, but I invite you to visit the project website, re-entanglements.net, and of course, the exhibition itself, to get a fuller sense of what we've been doing. As treasures, looted in the context of a violent colonial military campaign, the case of the so-called Benin Bronzes is from an ethical point of view relatively straightforward, and museums are increasingly acknowledging that their claim on these artworks is not ethically supportable. The Reentanglements Project, an exhibition, is concerned with archives and collections where the case is, I'd suggest, not so straightforward, and it is the question of the status of these cultural materials that I should like to pose in this short presentation. The exhibition itself is conceived as a space of debate. Its various installations use the archives and collections from a series of colonial anthropological surveys in Nigeria and Sierra Leone to pose questions about the significance and values of these materials today. Can the legacies of colonial projects, photographs, sound recordings, botanical specimens, written descriptions, contribute to contemporary projects of decolonizing history and reclaiming heritage. The surveys were, were led by this man, Northcote Thomas, who was the first government anthropologist to be appointed by the British Colonial Office. He led three anthropological surveys in southern Nigeria between 1909 and 1913, the first of which was among Edo-speaking communities. And during this time, he spent several months in Benin City itself. This was, of course, just 12 years after the British military campaign. He conducted a fourth survey in Sierra Leone in 1914 to 15. 
the exhibition is not about the surveys themselves, but rather with what we might call the decolonial afterlives of the materials that emerged from them and which have been hidden away in museum storerooms and archives for over a century. This display case provides some of the background context and shows the technologies used by Thomas and his local assistants that produced the archival materials. Unfortunately, there isn't time now to discuss the various displays. One thing the exhibition seeks to do, however, is to recognize the plurality of perspectives and responses that these colonial images, objects, sounds, and texts elicit. For many, these physical type portraits epitomize the violences of colonial racial science. But what is understood as an offensive, objectifying image by one person may be cherished by another for the visceral connection it affords with an ancestor. We've collaborated with many Nigerian and Sierra Leonean artists, inviting them also to interrogate these images and artifacts. We've mined the archives and collections for metaphors that speak to the coloniality of their context, metaphors of damage and fragmentation, but also intimations of repair and transformation. I'd like to um, play just a short clip of a documentation film uh, about the exhibition that we've made, which hopefully will give you a, a sense of the, of the exhibition and the kind of debates we're trying to, uh, to provoke. The way I see folks who were colonized, I, I like to think of us as um, a very strong and beautiful people. I think it's very, very important that we don't erase what happened or we don't try to rewrite history we had amazing crafts, we had, you know, our own cultures, history, our sense of um, self. We had our own civilizations, they still exist. It's not just the, 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 the item, it's the story around it. I thought seeing the reconstructed pots and the, and the broken bits and the, it just told the story on its own. When I began to make the fragments, I began to think about Africa as a fragmented people, right from when the African continent was cut up in Berlin. Same fragmentation has continued up to today. They are still fragmenting us. I mean, like many, many, many of the characters that Northcourt um, encountered and took photos of. They all have very um, significant things, topics to talk about. In the time I have left, I'd like to focus on the questions posed by this installation of a quarry, sometimes called rattle stamps, acquired by Northcote Thomas in Benin City in 1909. The Akure are juxtaposed with photographs from Thomas's surveys showing similar stars in their cultural context. In the background is this image of the ancestral altar in Chief Azomo's palace, also from 1909. You can see the Akure leaning against the back wall of the altar. They were traditionally commissioned to be carved by an eldest son on the passing of his father and placed on the altar. Collectively, they presence the spirits of the ancestors. Bakori are also used in ceremonies relating to the various Edo deities or Ebo. These carry representations of the Ebo at the top. Here, for example, are Northcote Thomas's photographs documenting the use of a quarry during the Ovia festival in Iowa, a few miles north of Benin City. Tom has also made audio recordings of the various stages of the ceremonies he's fo he photographed. Families, especially chiefly families, still have ancestral altars, which still bear Okure. Here is the present altar in the Azomo's palace, and here is the Azomo himself holding Thomas's photograph of the same altar as it was 110 years before. One can buy ready-made Okure in Benin City today, or commission a carver to make one. But back to the questions posed by those Okure collected by Northcote Thomas. 
It is often suggested that all collections in ethnographic or world cultures museums were looted or stolen like the Benin bronzes. In fact, the majority of collections were acquired through purchase or exchange. And this is one of the reasons why conducting provenance research is so important. These Akure, for instance, were not stolen from some ancestral altar in an act of desecration. Through surviving correspondence, we know that Thomas commissioned them to be made. In a letter to Charles Hercules Reed of the British Museum, dated July 14th, 1909, Thomas writes that, quote, I have ordered all the, the jujus, quote, of Benin City to be carved, probable cost 25 pounds. That's approximately equivalent to 3,000 pounds today, so a substantial commission. Thomas was under the impression that Reed had agreed that the British Museum would acquire the collections he was making and reimburse the outlay he had made. This was one of the reasons he kept such detailed accounts of transactions. In his reply, however, Reed states that Thomas had got this wrong. Referring to the Akure Thomas had commissioned, Reed writes, quote, I am by no means sure that I want these modern things made to order, as it were. Reed was, incidentally, a central figure in the British Museum's acquisitions of the Benin treasures looted in 1897. Along with the majority of Thomas's collections, the Akure were eventually acquired by the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge. Here are the catalogue pages, which list the various deities, or ebo, carved at the tops of the stars. And here are the corresponding Akure themselves. In correspondence with Bernard Struck, the curator of the Museum for Volkerkunde in Dresden, dating to 1924, Thomas mentions the Akure, noting that he had commissioned the head of the Wood and Ivory Carvers Guild to make them. In anticipation of the re-entanglements exhibition, we also commissioned a traditional carver in Benin City to make an Akure. Here is Felix Ekator making the staff in his workshop. At its top is a carving of Northcote Thomas. We place this newly carved Akure in the display alongside those commissioned by Thomas as a kind of disruption. Felix Ekator's Akure poses a question regarding Thomas himself. Is this colonial anthropologist a worthy ancestor? Should his memorial stand? Should we remember him as an agent of colonialism or as someone who tirelessly documented Nigerian cultural heritage? It also poses a question regarding the status of the historical Okure and other collections acquired in similar circumstances. How legitimate is the museum's claim on these heritage objects? Ethically, is there a substantive difference between these historically acquired Okure and the Okure that we ourselves commissioned? These things are all entangled in colonial histories, histories and entanglements that are not finished. But my question is whether we do not require a more nuanced understanding of such colonial collections in these decolonial times. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much to each of our speakers. Thank you, each of you, for um, paying attention to time. I really appreciate that. It's not always the case, and that, that makes my life so much easier. I don't look like a bad witch uh, sitting here. And so now it's time for uh, questions and answers um, and thoughts and reflections. There's been some activity in the chat. Some questions have been answered already but I would still like to repose uh, a couple of them and have um, all or any of the presenters speak to those and maybe people in the audience also want to add their own responses. So there was a question that um, looks very simple on the face of it. I think that it's a very loaded question and um, um, Maybe in some senses also the ensuing discussion could be quote unquote controversial. So the question asks, um, what do Africans want to do with these um, artifacts if they are returned? And um, you know, if uh, you know that 
the fact that this question is even uh, being asked also assumes certain things, but I leave that to um, the three of you and any others to respond to. Um, and uh, Kweku asks if there's a good witch. Um, I hope so. <laughs> anyway, so yes, over, over, over to you. Uh, Dan's hand is up. Dan, please, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and so, yes, it's a really important issue to raise what happens when things are returned. We saw, you know, the ceremonies in uh, Paris, in Cambridge, in Aberdeen last week. But of course, they're going to be mirrored by welcome ceremonies and events that happen in uh, Senegal and in uh, Nigeria, in Edo State, in the same way as we've already seen, of course, in uh, in um, yeah, Madagascar uh, and so on. Um, so, you know, I think it's really, really important for us to, to underline that as a museum professional, as a museum curator, you know, restitution has been a central part of our working lives for 30 or 40 years in, in the very different historical circumstances of the return of the Nazi loot, in the case of ancestral human remains for indigenous communities in North America and in the Pacific, this is a normal part of our operation. And so when it comes to returning African items when they're demanded, I think the first thing is we can no longer hold on to this idea that we would never countenance a return to an African, um, in a case of an African object. You know, not least when in some of these cases, the distinction we make in, you know, here in the UK, in between a, a human remain and a cultural object is far more entangled when we're talking about ancestral items. But also absolutely centrally, we've learned from, from those, those, from this long experience of how restitution works, that it's a case by case approach. It does take time, but it doesn't involve endless conversation. It does move forward. So we are able to say, well, you know, we used to ask, in the, I'm old enough to remember in the 90s and the 80s that people used to say, if you return a looted painting to someone that was a victim of the Holocaust, a survivor or, or a descendant, you know, what happens to the painting? Maybe it won't be on display. Maybe it will be lost to the world. Well, absolutely. It's their object. <laughs> they can do what they choose with it. For human remains, when we return them to indigenous people, we do not say you have to build a racist museum to display this human, this, this ancestral human remain. No, of course, normally those items, are, those human remains are, are actually destroyed because they are buried. And there is some sense of, you know, decency, you know, and some attempt to reconcile these pasts and the horror of what has happened. So we have to do the same, I think, in these cases. Uh, there will be a different answer to the question according to each object, each of the claimants, but we no longer can say never. And as a final point in terms of, you know, one of the points that Paul made, I'm really not sure after Sar Savoir, that we can restrict these conversations only to items that were subject to military sort of taking. The important thing about Sar Savoir is it showed us a typology of taking. It showed us some items were taken under extreme violence. Some items were taken by missionaries seeking to destroy traditional religion. Some items were purchased. Some items were made for commission. But is it possible to buy? or to commission items actually which are inalienable, which are sort of in fund, which are non-fungible, which cannot be bought and sold because of their relationship to, to ancestral identity and to forms of humanity and sort of culture. So they're the questions we need to ask. It's a case by case basis, but this absolutely is not only about the Benin bronzes. Thanks very much, uh, Dan. I know, uh, Onyekachi, you responded in the chat box, but I wonder whether you and Paul have anything to add to that. And either of you can go and remember to unmute yourselves. I don't really. I mean, I think ultimately if it belongs, if we're returning something that belongs to the people, they will use it how they want. And But I, 
did give in the chat box some uh, in the Q and A box some ways in which people will use it. I just um, a couple of points I'd like to add, um, and again, it's not um, a disagreement on matters of principle, but it's about dealing with ambiguities. Um, and um, you know, uh, and this is the this is the problem. And Dan has criticised this this notion, you know, throwing something back into the area of ambiguity causes delay, causes inaction. So I'm not by any means advocating that. But at the same time, I think one needs to think. Um, um, we're talking as if um, ownership in Africa um, is 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 always uncontested, and we know that this isn't the case. So we can't just ignore these these matters. Um, is it um, you know a question of the a palace? Uh, is it a question of um, a museum authority? Is it a question of the actual descendants, for instance, of people that uh, you know made or maybe represented in images or whose voices are um, uh, recorded, for instance? So there's potentially a plethora of different owners, local owners of this material, and that. Um, is challenging. Um, um, the point I was trying to make wasn't one of um, simply these things, if they were acquired um, through purchase, for example, are therefore not um, uh, um, to, be, to be returned, so much as to, again, just to open up the complexity, because I think the debate has been skewed through actually ethically straightforward cases. Uh, and I think there is a difference between uh, objects that were looted in the context of military expeditions, as opposed to ones which may have been purchased. Um, and one can project certain things onto uh, objects that they may not possess. Often um, objects were manufactured but not activated ritually, let's say, and they have a different status than what Dan was referring to in being inalienable. In fact, many objects were alienable. They were per you could buy them in the in the market. They didn't necessarily have that ritual efficacy until they'd been uh, through a, a, a ritual kind of thing. So we can we can project things onto objects. Um, and that's why I wanted to raise the question of what's the difference between um, us, for instance, as part of this exhibition, commissioning an Okure as opposed to Thomas. Um, neither of them went through a ritual kind of process, I believe. Um, and um, there are still inequalities in the world. Coloniality exists. You know, my purchasing power may be rather than different than Felix, the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the carver who we commissioned it from. So it's not as if that's the colonial context, this is not. So what does this mean? Because actually Felix was rather keen to um, have his Accore displayed in an exhibition in, in Cambridge. And so, yeah, I wonder if I could just uh, sort of agree with, with a lot of what you've uh, just said there, Paul. Uh, exactly, I think, I mean, we absolutely agree it's a case-by-case -case basis. I think we have to, though, be very careful of the slippery slope, uh, you know, that we can find ourselves on when entanglements and complexities are put forward by some in these conversations as reasons not to return when a demand has been made. So to take, let's say, examples where there are multiple contested claims within a nation state, it's our job in you know, the Northern Hemisphere to put faith in the legal processes and in the ethical processes in institutions in, let's say, Nigeria or other African nations to work these issues out without the ongoing interference or the 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 role of the museum curator or the academic as the judge and uh, jury on that process the idea one of the one one of the really uh, a part of the complexities a part of the practical upshot of the complexities that you point to it you know is a major question that's unresolved in our field at the moment about whether we have to have all of those issues resolved before any sort of return can be made or whether we we maybe lower the standards of evidence 
that we accept in some cases, and maybe we allow the risk there to return in some cases, maybe something that is then further contested for another 125 years in some cases, um, to allow the life history of these, these items to not continue to be uh, dominated by the act of taking you know, in which our, institution, our institutions were involved, and to find ways to remove ourselves from those conversations. But I totally agree that those cases that you, you know, your, your, you know, the cases you're talking about are very different from, let's say, the, you know, let's say the Ben and Bronzes. Uh, Onyekachi, before, before you come in, let me, I, I don't know, I'm not going to presume what you are going to, to say, but when you respond, perhaps you can also um, speak to the notion of, as is coming out in the chat, and also emerges from what both Paul and Dan have, have said, you know, what, what is the responsibility of museums um, in, in facilitating, if you, if you like, that uh, conversation? The, 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 the questioner says, what responsibility do institutions have for negotiating competing claims? For example, between direct descendants and national institutions, and and I would add also, in in whatever it is that institutions do, you know, who should they be inviting to the table? I know that we will look at this on a case by case basis, but maybe there is some you know kind of, I don't know, formula for want of a of a better word. I know you understand what I mean. So thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the Nigerians did attempt to come up with um, a what I thought was a good structure, which was they, they set up a, a, um, a, a trusteeship um, with uh, an organization that the, all the claimants were represented on, which was um, the federal government, the state government, and the, the palace, the other. Um, and then it seemed to, to me that a great idea that everything could be returned, for instance, to that body, um, that body, uh, was saying that it wasn't necessarily the, the final destination, but it, it then provided a framework in Nigeria where all those issues could be resolved. Now, it hasn't gone as smoothly as possible, but that is a possible way to get around this. Um, but the broader point I was gonna make was really on two fronts, just in response to Paul. One, one was that there, there is, um, I watched the images of the, the, the relics and the, um, that were returned to Madagascar from um, when they were um, earlier this year. And it was very moving. And it was um, the whole country of, you know, and the capital came out when it landed at the airport and her crown and different parts uh, um, was then transported to the to where it was the final resting place. The streets were all lined. And what we were witnessing was almost that if history had been frozen when this stuff, when they were conquered, because that's what it was. And now history was alive again. And it seems to me that these contestations in our countries are part of history coming back. Um, you know, Benin uh, has a right to talk to the Nigerian state in terms of its relationship to the Nigerian state, to have a conversation about where these items um, rightly belong. Um, is it, do they belong in a national museum? Do they belong in the Abbas Palace since they were um, family relics? And, uh, uh, or do they belong in a state museum? So those are conversations that Nigeria can have you know, within the context of, you know, the big restructuring that we're having in the Nigerian state at the, uh, at the moment about what belongs to the, to the federal government and, you know, the competencies that belong to the states and the competencies that belong to the local governments. And, and, and that's history coming back alive. Um, so, but I don't think it's for people sitting in London to mediate that. I think that, you know, that we, we it, it's another, it just comes across as another way of kind of infantilizing African politics. Um, and yeah, we, there, some of those discussions in Africa are gonna be very robust um, and they have to do with underlying issues that, I mean, um, um, that are preventing the Nigerian state actually acting uh, as effectively as it can, which is this relationship, as I said, in terms of the competences at the different levels, federal, 
you know, uh, state and, and local and then the individual or communities. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, we, we need to wrap up soon. So I'm going to give each of you uh, a minute to speak to whatever is burning um, heaviest on your hearts. But just to ask also that one or the other of you might consider um, you know, this notion of the extent to which um, there's a question from <coughs> Felix or Felix Martin about the extent to which museums have incorporated technology in their curation. And I think that dovetails into Flora uh, Mara's question about what about digital rights? So we'll return the object, but we'll re retain um, the digital rights. And then there was a direct question to um, to Paul, I don't know if you've seen it in the chat. It's a it's a longish question. Maybe you want to use your minute um, to speak to that. And then there was one more about how you all feel about um, craftsmen making replicas. So a Benin mask, a golden stool, uh, whatever it is. So you each have your one minute to use as you wish, and then we'll turn it over to Shireen to make some final announcements, and then we'll say um, call it a day. Thanks. We should go first. Okay, I'll go first. Um, um, I want to thank you first, uh, Akus, uh, for facilitating this uh, um, really brilliantly. Um, but in terms of my comment, it was it was really, um, you know, there was a, a question asked about the British Museum um, being the custodian of a global story. And, and I always wonder why the universal is only ever possible in the West. Why, why can't uh, Africans be the custodians of global stories? And this actually goes to the heart of this issue of um, the center and the, and the periphery and the relationships that we're trying to reverse. Um, it isn't only possible for the, the, uh, the British Museum or, or London to tell this global story. Um, and if the rest of us have to come to London, and uh, in the last session that I, I participated in, a, a leading scholar who is a, a, a curator, the leading museum in South Africa, wasn't able to travel to London because of you know the issues we have about migration. So it, you know we we need to decentralize power. We need to decentralize this notion of the universal and. At, at least in terms of the very beginning, Africans need to be able to um, be able to tell their part and, and own their part of the universal story. Thank you. Who's going next? And so I'm happy okay. to go next. Uh, sure, Dan, and go ahead. Give the last word to Paul. So I would just um, sort of point everyone here who isn't aware of it already to the very important case being brought by, by Tamara Lanier against Harvard. This is the descendant of two enslaved people who were photographed in 1850. And the daguerreotypes, Tammy has argued, are her property. So I was, I, I was approached to write uh, one of the amici, one of the expert witness statements that went before the Massachusetts Supreme Court last Monday, a week ago today. And fascinatingly, the court was fairly skeptical of the property right Harvard has in those photographs. So we need to watch what's happening with the images of the ancestors. We need to watch what's happening with the recognition of human remains in our anthropology museums. And we need to watch the third leg of that stool, which is what's happening with cultural items. This is, an, uh, this, is an, this is a fundamental shift in how we see anthropology, how we see the spaces anthropology has carved out, not because of something local about our discipline, but because, you know, anthropology was a central part of the creation of forms of white supremacy that are with us in the present. And that physical dismantling of the ongoing violences that are hidden away in our stores, it isn't, it isn't enough for us simply to do nothing anymore. You know, so the wider public are, are, have an interest here and let's watch and see what happens with that legal case, which will be so important for anti-racism and so important for ethical practices in our museums. 
Thank you, Dan. If you have um, any link that you could share in the in the chat on the latest, you said it was just Mondays. That would be great, I'm sure, for everyone to read. Um, over to you, Paul. Um, I always have a habit of playing devil's advocate, I think, just to, <laughs> because I think the important thing is for us to debate, to debate these things um, and to also attend to the complexities in these. I suppose I'd like to just um, look at the other side of anthropology in my closing comments, which is, yes, uh, I, and I by, by no means uh, would want to escape the um, you, you, Dan's critique of anthropology and its history. But there's another side of anthropology, um, which is about human curiosity and uh, understanding each other. Um, and I think that um, there's a more cosmopolitan kind of um, worldview as well. I'm, I'm, I'm worried um, in all of this, in these debates, this kind of cultural war type of version of this debate, is that we end up um, kind of enclosed again into very narrow kind of um, identities, essentialized identities, very territorialized identities, um, which um, goes against the, the gist of our understanding of our long history as migrant species. We're all African in that sense, you know. Um, and I think there's, um, there's something that's lost when we kind of bring, bring up the borders, as it were, and so I suppose my um, hope is that there is uh, beyond this uh, a more cosmopolitan, a more hopeful, uh, you know, sense of being, um, a sh you know, sh sharing the world and sharing these responsibilities in a more just way, of course, uh, than than our you know history has shown us. Um, so I think it's 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 that sense that I'd like to <laughs> to leave with, um, rather than this one where you know. I can only speak for my village, as it were. Thank you so much. And um, as this is a conversation, I don't know if the organizers are able to share the questions with all the presenters. I'm sorry, there's a plane flying overhead, so I'm going to shout to drown it out. Um, Shireen, I don't know if it's possible to share the questions with the presenters and whether the presenters would um, care to continue that conversation off this space. I know everyone's busy and, and so on, so I, I leave that to all of you to decide. And um, Shireen is going to have the last word, so I just want to thank um, all three of you for fascinating and extremely edifying, if at times painful, conversation. And of course, to the audience for their insightful questions, and I hope that this you know, there's there, there's a rumbling going on, and that um, you know, as the stone rolls, it will indeed gather a lot of moss. So over to you, Sharon, and thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, I particularly want to thank Onikachi Wambu because if he hadn't um, taken the initiative to get in touch with LIDC and say, let's hold this webinar, it might have been another couple of months. At some point, I would have, I'm sure, I would have, because it's a passion of mine. Um, but thank you so much, Ani Kashi, for proposing that F4DK and LIDC get together and, and host this discussion. Um, we are going to post the recording so that people who weren't able to join us today and those who are able to join us today will be able to access it. Um, in terms of typing out and sharing all the um, questions, we'll see what we have the capacity to do because our days are already very long, but the recording will definitely be there and we do invite people to get in touch with us, either via our website or via Twitter or whatever, um, with your ideas, suggestions and feedback. Learned a lot here today. We never stop learning. That's the, the joy of working for an organization like LIDC. So very, very grateful. Um, you don't have to be in an LIDC member institution in order to join LIDC. Um, you can just, just Google join LIDC and take it from there. We'd love to have you as part of our network. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to the moderator. Thank you to the initiator, um, Brother Wambu, and um, thank you all for joining us. We hope we will see you again. I'm very grateful that we had you with us today. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>